Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to be, uh, well, let me just get started while the presentation doesn't come up. I'm going to tell you about something a little different this year. Uh, I've, as you, most of you know, I have flying sharks, but I'm also a, a part-time professor, marine biology in Portugal. And uh, it's been a real privilege to get the students involved in a lot of the activities that we have with flying sharks. Uh, at the same time, we've been sponsoring uh, some research over the years, and I've told you about that a couple of years ago. So today I'm going to tell you about some of the results of that research that have been made available uh, to all of us over the years, particularly those results that somehow have a positive impact on the way that we conduct our business, because um, you'll see that the first couple of projects, I'll kind of fly through those kind of quickly, because they're, well, let's just say, um, well, not really applied research. But then the second half of those projects, they're really very specific to our industry, so we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, with those. Okay, so, ah, this is for all the Star Wars fans out there. Yes, okay. So it actually all started back in 97, uh, before Flying Sharks, in fact. Uh, myself and a few friends, we started the Portuguese Elasma Bank Association. Uh, we started by giving out these really small uh, grants, um, 125 euros, so, you know, really cheap. But over the years, we've, uh, we've given a lot of these grants. The first one was in 99. Uh, we've paid through to a lot of folks to go to Bimini and spend some time with Dr. Gruber. So we, we've been doing that for some time. Then in 2006, Flying Sharks was born. 2008, we started awarding the Flying Sharks Research Fund, which basically you've, be, you've made that possible. Our clients uh, add a percentage to their invoice uh, very graciously, very generously, and we've made that, those funds available to students. I'll just point out a couple of uh, folks. We've heard Paula talk about the Sawfish um, workshop a um, couple of months ago. We, we proudly paid for two of the um, Brazilian participants in that workshop. Uh, we, we like to, um, to be a small part in, in uh, Greg's um, awesome work with, uh, with Nautilus that we've all seen a couple of days ago. So a couple of years ago, we contributed to that. And there's a couple of other people you'll hear about um, in just a few slides. Now, uh, this is what our uh, research fund page looks like. I just pointed out um, the institutions that are here, the Virginia Marine Science, New England Aquarium, uh, Semester at Sea, this institution that goes to Portugal every now and then, they've been uh, contributing, the Tennessee Aquarium. So thank you very much to all of these guys. So project number one, Ana Cicada, Portuguese young lady who had a dream. She really, really wanted to work with whale sharks. Uh, she applied and applied. She, got, uh, she kept getting shut down by all these applications. But eventually, in 2010, she got a few grants. We bought her a plane ticket to uh, Australia. She's doing really cool work um, on her PhD thesis, which is just finished a couple of days ago, in fact. Uh, trying to understand which variables influence whale shark distribution. Uh, she's um, seen that sea surface temperatures have an influence on whale shark distribution. And of course, she correlated that to climate change scenarios. So that, that, that's a cool story. And all of those results obviously are available. It's a cool story for public aquaria to tell their visitors. Elena Zanella uh, is a young lady from Costa Rica. She's basically uh, working on Mission Tiburon, uh, shark mission, um, an ONG that she started there. Uh, she's studying. Um, uh, these um, white tip reef sharks uh, out in um, Costa Rica. She's seen that they, uh, they don't really have a spatial ontogenetic segregation. They're sort of all over the place. Uh, they, they have res specific resident sites. She estimated the local population uh, and their size. So she's really doing a really cool work out there in Costa Rica, and it's um, really you know, uh, rewarding to be a part of that. Uh, Ismet Saigu, Turkish young man who's uh, there, uh, is um, working with discarded animals in commercial fisheries. 
Uh, he just finished his ma master's. He's moving on to his PhD. He's slowly turning into the shark guy in Turkey. He's, he's going on TV and in uh, talk shows. He's really knowledgeable about this stuff. And obviously, needless, needless to say, discards uh, in commercial fisheries are a very, very important subject these days. So it, that's another cool story to tell. André Afonso, Portuguese young man, he's um, uh, now working in Recife, the shark attack capital of the world, as some of you might know. Uh, very, very nasty business over there. Uh, André is basically um, tracking sharks out there. Uh, he's using spot tags, he's using um, pop-up tags, he's doing really cool uh, stuff. He's also looking at human uh, interaction with uh, tiger sharks. Uh, I don't need to tell you that the sharks usually win in these type interactions. So this is another cool story to tell. Valentina Di Santo, uh, Italian young lady, working at the uh, University of uh, Massachusetts in Boston doing very, very, very cool research on the early life stages of rays, the embryonic life stages, because of course, whatever affects these early life stages creates some sort of a bottleneck effect that's going to um, affect the entire population. Uh, she's looking at performance curves, really, really cool stuff. I have to admit, I, I'd never even heard of these performance curves. It kind of tells you whether an animal will respond to a change, in this case, temperature, whether it will adapt to that change or whether it will perform differently because of that change. Anyway, cool stuff, and Valentina is doing this stuff with Ray's out of Boston. Uh, again, correlating all of that stuff into climate change, which, once more, is a really cool story to tell. And all of this data, obviously, is available for anyone who wants to share this stuff with their, with their public. Uh, number six, uh, Jimena Velez a uh, young lady from Peru, also working with commercial fisheries. Uh, she's looking at uh, hammerheads, specifically the smooth hammerhead. She's, uh, she's getting some scary results, like most of the commercial fishery in Peru is landing juvenile smooth hammerheads. And, and of course, Jimena is doing her very best to influence uh, local politics and to do some lobbying to protect these smooth hammerheads. Uh, she's got some very, very recent information, again, that these uh, commercial fishermen are targeting nursery areas. Most of the sharks they're catching, or some of the sharks they're catching, are newborn. So scary, scary stuff out there. And we're trying to help him in as, as best as we can. Finally. Uh, we move into the more um, aquarium-oriented um, projects. Well, the first thing I should say about this picture is that uh, times are hard in Europe. So uh, we're, well, we're branching out. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll just stop right there. I don't want to offend anyone. I will just say that we do have a long list of phone numbers available for those of you. <laughs> Uh, and we do make discounts to friends, but I'll just stop right there. <laughs> so anyway, Luis Silva, uh, he's a former student of mine, um, he, a very good student. He's now working out of the Azores with Flying Sharks. He's also doing his uh, master's thesis, really cool thesis on Anthias Anthias. Uh, Beth got some of these animals that Luis collected himself with some guys um, a couple of weeks ago. Anyway. These, the, these fish, they're collected at uh, 4, 45 meters off Fayal. Obviously, they can't be brought up to the surface really quick. Their, their swim bladder will explode. So Luis is working with that. Uh, now, uh, the idea is to collect these antheas at 40 to 45 meters, to put them in these buckets. By the way, I did say times are hard. None of these buckets were bought. These guys basically scrounged the beaches in Fayal. They got these buckets for free. They cleaned them up. They bleached them. They put the antheas inside, and then they raised them over a course of a few days. And this is Luis's uh, protocol. He's devised a really clever scheme. So uh, he, he has this 15% uh, decrease in pressure. That means that uh, the animals will be raised to the surface to the surface with 15% pressure decreases. And that can be done either in 12-hour intervals or 24-hour intervals. Then he's got a 25% decrease, 35, 45. So it took a whole lot of Anthias Anthias, as you can imagine, to have like a really nice uh, scientific um, experimental protocol, because we are publishing this stuff. And over, the, over time, 
Uh, obviously, uh, I could go on and on about this one particular project. I'm just summarizing it really quickly for you. Obviously, what we want is neutrally buoyant fish at the surface. We don't want animals that are positively buoyant. We also don't want animals that are negatively buoyant. So we want positively buoyant fish. Those are, you know, they're, they're, they're adapted to their new pressure. Obviously, the lesser pressure decrease gives you a higher um, percentage of positively buoyant animals and obviously also the 24-hour delay in between um, uh, rising of the of the fish also gives you a higher uh, neutrally buoyant percentage. So uh, Luis, after months and months of work, came up with this. This is the ideal ascension protocol. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details. Obviously, uh, all of this stuff is available. I'll gladly go over all of uh, go over it all with you. Uh, during the coffee break, but this is basically, you know, the the ideal uh, pressure reduction protocol to bring these fish from down to 30, 40 meters all the way up to the surface, and it'll take about 84 hours to do this in the real perfect way. So, uh, Ugo, Rui, Tiago, and Bruno. Um, uh, this is um, again. Well, what can I say? Uh, you should see these guys in the fireman outsuit um, uh, outfit. It's <laughs> Quite, quite a sight. Anyway, <laughs> um, these guys are all uh, students of mine also. Uh, they're working on their senior thesis. Uh, so two of them are focusing on two species, two of them are working on these other two species. And the objective was really, really simple. We had the feeling that we were packing our fish very lightly. We were being too conservative because flying sharks really started doing mostly big shipments. We were putting a lot of uh, big fish and sharks and rays on tanks, putting them on planes and flying them all over the place. Obviously, the economics uh, in the world today have really cut those big shipments down um, substantially, so we're mostly doing the box shipments these days and we thought you know we're being overly conservative uh, with with this so let's get some students to work on this and see just how far we can go obviously ensuring survival and animal welfare so okay here we go so the idea was to have a, a nice experimental protocol again where we would have some control fish and some fish with amquel some fish without amquel and we would open these bags at 24 hours and some at 48 and some at 72 we would monitor ammonia ph oxygen and obviously percent survival a hundred percent needless to say is our our goal so these guys uh, basically started doing this with these four species uh, over, um, over a few weeks. I'm not going to go over all of the details. I'm just going to show you some quick and dirty results. For example, for Lepadogaster, you can see that 24, 48, 72 hours. This is actually in Portuguese because I pulled this out straight from their, uh, from their final reports. I did that on purpose uh, so you could see this is you know, their stuff. So different concentrations of fish, uh, different bioloads, 10, 15, 30, 40. And you can see that this is the 100% oxygen saturation. And even after 72 hours, these fish are still at about 90% uh, saturation. So that's cool, that's cool. We, and uh, we were bagging these things at 10 grams per liter. And we learned that we can actually bag them at 40, which is four times more, which makes it so much more cost effective for the client. Anyway, uh, moving on to the next species, again, uh, at 10 and 15 grams per liter, everything is fine. After 72 hours, they're all, oxygen is still at around 100. And, but when we get to 30 grams per liter, there's really a marked drop in oxygen. So this, this is no good. This is a, the, the bio load that we know we cannot use. Um, another species again, uh, this is fine, uh, but these two are not good. You know, we get really sudden drops in oxygen. And finally, uh, these two concentrations are fine for the diplodus. These two are not. Again, let's not dwell too much into the, the, these details. I've got all of this stuff with me if you want to look at it more carefully. So this is the nice experimental protocol that they've devised. And um, obviously, uh, this has yielded really cool results and we're now able to They've helped us work out uh, these new higher bioloads that we can use. 
So, uh, this is another cool project, which is really at, on, at its early stages. I, I'm afraid I don't really have um, results per se to share with you. But these two guys, Hugo and João Chambel, uh, they're looking at these bacteria, uh, at these packs that they want to use in long-term transports that will really process ammonia and all sorts of nitrogenous waste uh, in transport. There's some work out there being done on this, as, as we all know, uh, but these guys, they're really trying to fine-tune their and um, so basically come up with this sort of package that you use in your filtration during long-term tra long transports and uh, you get at the end of the transport with zero ammonia and all done in a really natural way. But again, uh, hopefully next year we might have some cool results about this. It's really at its very early stages. Uh, getting close to the end, Monica and... Um, and the Sarah, and I, I completely forgot this one detail. You probably saw that there's these logos on top of, um, of each of these slides. That's the institution that basically sponsored this, this uh, study. Like, for example, the, um, the contribution from the Tennessee Aquarium, who just got some, some, um, some um, cuttlefish eggs from us a couple of weeks ago, their contribution uh, has made this, this um, study possible. So basically, Monica and Sarah are working with um, uh, cuttlefish eggs. They're looking at three distinct diets, uh, live mice, this live um, uh, local shrimp that we get, uh, and the dead mussels. And they're basically uh, working out that live mice with their uh, baby newborn cuttlefish Give, uh, gives out insane growth. The, the crab, or the, sorry, the shrimp I was telling you about, you know, you get reasonable growth. Uh, the mussels, not good. The, the baby cuttlefish don't like that at all. Final project, uh, Ugu Murais. You've seen Ugu in a bunch of uh, uh, projects uh, before. Very hard-working young man. He's basically doing his master thesis working with uh, flying sharks, also a student of mine, and he's working on these three things. He's really focusing on the collection and husbandry, and husbandry of uh, brand new species, uh, mice shrimp reproduction, and lepadogaster, the clingfish here, um, uh, reproduction, uh, closion and um, rearing. So, these are some of the new species he's working on. Uh, we just sent uh, some of these uh, black belly rosefish to Steve Bailey a couple of weeks ago, or uh, months ago, I should say. There's these other uh, cool species here that Ugu is working on. We have a really nice partnership with, um, with a commercial fisherman. Ugu goes out on the boat in seven, eight, nine foot waves. Uh, he chums a lot, but uh, hey, I, um, I would too if I was there with him. So, uh, he's working really hard. Um, mice shrimp repro reproduction, these, these are sequential pictures that uh, uh, Hugo has taken. He's very, very close to closing the cycle uh, out there. You know, it, it's been done before. Hugo's not the only guy in the world reproducing mice, as we all know. But uh, it's a big deal out there in the, in the school where we teach, and it's going to make our lives so much easier when we get this stuff closed. Anyway, and uh, Lepadogaster, he's been working, working really hard with this stuff, and uh, he's nailed this. He's, he's breeding these things left and right, which, uh, which we all were very happy with. So, in conclusion, um, you know, th these are, this is a no-brainer. Research makes sense. We all know that. Uh, sharing the results of this research, uh, of course, with the public makes all the sense in the world. Uh, if that research makes our lives easier, if it increases animal uh, well-being, if, you know, it's all good. And uh, so, for all these reasons, it makes sense to support uh, this research. Now, uh, I want to thank the RAW program committee. RAW has a very special meaning to me, as you all know. Two years ago, my uh, wife and I um, um, escaped to Las Vegas. We got married, Star Wars over there. And uh, I'll just pull that out because I don't want that to end on Facebook and uh, that'll get me in a world of hurt. So thank you very much for your attention.